Good afternoon, everybody. I have been away for a couple of days now. I've spent the weekend with my granddaughter, my youngest one, and we've been having a ball fixing up her room and sorting her clothes and sorting her toys, and we've just had fun. And I'm ready to get back to work. So, in the process of trying to figure out what to do uh, for a video today, I spoke with Discovering the Truth, and she has found out a piece of information that you're going to want to hear. Now, the first audio clip that you're going to hear is from True Crime Mysteries. Her name is Megan, and this is a video she put out a while back, but I'm taking the audio out of it because it explains a little bit about what we're talking about today. She does it a little bit better than what I think I can. And there's not a lot of information out there, not, you know, that's easily gotten a hold of to explain this. So please listen through the audio and I will come back afterwards and we'll discuss why we're doing this video today. Now, listen up, guys. I'm going to put the fourth uh, item in there for the scavenger hunt. So make sure and listen for it. Also, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, do all that good stuff, guys. We are really climbing. The numbers are starting to go up, and we are aiming for 10,000 subscribers, and only you can make that happen, guys. Just you. Nobody else. But also hit the like button, because that shows YouTube that you like what you're watching, and that you're interested in it, and you want to see more of it, okay? So, I, and I may go live later today. I'm not sure. But listen to this, guys, because it's it's interesting. It's not specifically connected to Summer herself or her disappearance, but it was brought to light because of her di disappearance. So it sort of falls into that category. But listen up, and then I'll be right back to explain what I'm talking about. I wanted to explore the origins of the term John and Jane Doe. We hear these a lot in crime context as well as legal proceedings and you know I personally didn't know why we use the term so I thought I would do some research and I found out it's a very common question so I thought I would do a little little fact video about it. So we refer to John and Jane Doe when we don't know a person's identity so let's get into it. In 13th century England we began seeing John Doe in legal documents, as well as other fictitious names such as Richard Rowe, John Noakes, John Stiles, kind of etc. The tradition has been rooted in Roman customs, um, and they had also used fictitious parties in lawsuits. The surnames are associated with deer, a doe is a female deer, and a roe is a European deer species. The first name John and Richard were the most common first names, and the term Jane Doe is much newer than the male counterparts. Um, for much of history, unknown women were simply listed as unknown or were withheld for certain reasons. The English initially used the terms in land title disputes. This was established for landowners to solidify their ownership on certain lands. If there was any doubt as to who had a right to hold their land, instead of waiting for an actual person to sue them, they would sue themselves using a fictitious defendant. The lawsuit would set legal precedent as to who had the rights to the land and that land's boundaries. It was called the action of ejectment. This particular term was made obsolete in England by 1852 with the introduction of the Common Law Procedure Act, but it remained on within the legal system. We still use the term today, so why did it stick around? In the 19th century, John Doe became a symbol of the ubiquitous ordinary man. You began to see it pop up in books, films, advertisements, as well as continuing to be used in legal documents. In cases of unidentified bodies being called John and Jane Doe's, this is an act that gives an identity to a person whose identity is unknown. In regards to crimes, it can humanize a traumatic scenario to remind people that although their identity is unknown, they still deserve justice and respect. Fun fact, there are people with the legal name John and Jane Doe. In 2009, the New York Times reported the difficulties and unwanted attention experienced by a man named John Doe. 
He has an extremely difficult time traveling, applying for jobs, and housing. As most people assume, he's using a pseudonym. That is all I could find on the origins of this commonly used term. I don't know why we called unidentified persons John Doe, so hopefully, like me, you learned something new. Hey, hey guys, y'all know what that sound is? Now, I need five songs. This is going to be fun. This I need five songs. The titles, where Summer is in the title of the song. Go on Google. Go on YouTube. Pandora, it don't matter. With the name Summer in them. Now, that's the history of why or what history can be found about why we call unidentified people John and Jane Doe. What discovering the truth found was because she thought she had heard the name David Cohen before. And we all know the mystery of who David Cohen is or trying to figure out who David Cohen is. But what she found was, it says, having conducted an investigation, Fido could not find any entry under the name Kosminski. Kosminski. Uh, that's how I can pronounce it. For patients admitted to Colony Hatch Asylum in spring of 1889. In fact, Kaminsky would not arrive at the asylum until 1891, almost two years after these events supposedly took place. What Fido did find, however, was a patient admitted under the name of David Cohen, which was a generic John Doe name used for Jews in the East End without any known identity or address. Cohen was transferred to Colony Hatch after displaying violent behavior that put both him and others at risk, resulting in the need for him to be placed in restraints. Some of the notes about his time at Colony state that Cohen had to be force-fed food, wear strong dress, and because his tendency to tear his clothes off and was just generally regarded as being a destructive individual. Cohen was reported to have died in October 1889 at Colony Hatch of exhaustion of mania after several days confined to his bed. Now, I have found so many different articles and stuff talking about this, like this one where it says Cohen was brought before Thames magistrates on 7th of December 1888 as a lunatic wandering at large. He was found rambling in the street, speaking little but Yiddish. The magistrate sent him to the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary, where he was given the name of David Cohen, which was supposedly used as a John Doe for East End Jews. And in the same line, I believe it may have been on Reddit, I'm not sure where I got this from, but it says, what on earth are you going on about? The term John Doe came from America. David Cohen is a common enough Jewish name but was never used as a pseudonym, just a convenient name for this person. Which, so I guess there's people arguing that it's not true, that it's not used as an unidentified person. But it goes on to say, how do you know David Cohen was never used as a placeholder name for an unknown Jew? There are sources that suggest it was, it once was, at least in that era. Just because it no longer is does not mean it never was. Besides, they even say it was in Whitechapel. John Doe is a traditional name given to someone without an identity or whose real identity is unknown. Miles comments that because the killer has no birth certificate, he's practically a John Doe. And then Chandler realizes that back in 1888, Another name for a John Doe was David Cohen, and sure enough, one of the birth certificates says David Cohen, and considering they know who the final victim is going to be, and she happens to work with a guy called Cohen, who also has a link to one of the suspects, it's the obvious conclusion. Then we have, says, was the name David Cohen used in Victorian England as a placeholder name for Jewish immigrants. I've seen the claim that the name David Cohen was used at the time to refer to a Jewish immigrant who either could not be positively identified or whose name was too difficult for police to spell. 
in the same fashion that John Doe is used in the United States today in a few places, but the source tends to be from rip ripperologists, I guess is how you say that. But my point being is that with all the questioning and not knowing who this David Cohen is that's sending all these uh, emails to everybody, could he have been either a history buff or a Jack the Ripper um, big fan, you know, and have known about the the Jewish name, the David Cohen being used for Jewish unidentified people? Now, if you all will remember back, he sent me a email that states that his father was shipped back to Israel. So is he Jewish? So, I mean, does he know about this? Is that possibly why he picked the name David Cohen? I mean, it's it's a big question, guys. And I know this David Cohen thing has been beat to death. But with her running across this, could this be why he picked that name? Is because it's like a John Doe. You know, it's not really anybody. If you all have any more history on the name David Cohen or when it was used, where it was used at uh, to identify, to name unidentified people, please let me know. And then there's this one that says, the only reference I can find to this is an unsighted Wikipedia. So I'd put it at dubious. Phonetic spellings of shortened names were the norm in the U.S. for simplicity. The U.K. is outside my area of expertise. However, it wouldn't be terribly surprising either. Cohen, as the standard last name of Jewish priests, is extremely widespread as a name, as are its derivatives in various languages. David is probably the most common traditional Jewish name, whose usually Hebrew or Yiddish pronunciation is recognizably related to the English spelling. It's a very common combo. I've heard it used as a term for a typical Jewish guy in conversations before. So guys, like I said, it's just a thought. I'm wondering if there's some reason this guy, you know, picked this particular name to use or is his real name David Cohen? Because I mean, if you look on Google or look on YouTube, you can come up with all kinds of people. There's one guy that's uh, involved with racehorsing. It's five questions to David Cohen and it shows he's a real young guy. But he's involved in racing. I believe he owns racehorses or he, he's the jockey. I'm not sure. There's another dude that's like 50 something years old. He's autistic, but very intelligent. He can't comb his own hair, but he writes a bunch of political letters to people. He also uh, has a very great knowledge when it comes to symphony and, you know, like Beethoven and Bach and all that. So I, I don't know if David Cohen is an actual real person or if he's just a made up person and this is a name that he has given himself because it is so common and can be used for even people that we don't know who they are. And I know that sounds funny or weird, but give it a thought, ponder over it. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below and I'll see you guys on the next video.